Hi, now let's talk about when we would use a confidence interval for the population proportion in the real world. Let's jump right in. So first let's talk about Gallup polls. And back in 2015, I uh, ran a class and was looking at this statistic in specific. Before we jump into that, let's talk a little bit about these Gallup polls. It was a company founded by George Gallup back in 1935. And if you look at the fine print in news articles, um, in the newspaper or on, uh, on TV even, you'll see that a lot of the polls are conducted by Gallup. And if you want to search over to the website, it's really easy to find, just search Google Gallup. But uh, they've brought, they've kind of broadened to looking at business analytics and um, social sciences. So again, look at the um, kind of fine print and you'll see that Gallup is responsible for taking a lot of these polls. The Pew Research Center is another one of these uh, that we'll actually look at some examples from today. But just a little bit about, uh, about Gallup polls. So again, way back in 2015, uh, we were looking at this statistic and found that 58% of this sample uh, taken by Gallup um, favored legal use of marijuana. And that was back in October 7th uh, and through the 11th of 2015. And then in that article, it gave a kind of a time series plot of over time, uh, people have asked this question and it looks like the general trend is that uh, favoring legal use of marijuana has increased. So, um, but looking at that, again, that's over a sample. So what if we wanted to say, well, um, that's interesting. Uh, this is of a sample, don't we also want to report our level of uncertainty? Don't we also want to report our um, margin of error? And you'll see a lot of times it's in big print what the, what the, what the best estimate is or what the P hat is, what the population, or sorry, what the sample proportion is. And then a little bitty tiny print a lot of times, or even you have to search another link to find it, it'll tell what the margin of error is and what the sample size is and all the things we care about and what the confidence level is. So if you look back at this one, if you follow these links down here at the bottom, uh, specifically this PDF one, um, you'll come over here and you can find um, this guy. And so this was the Gallup News Service, Gallup Poll uh, Social Series uh, for Crime. And this was again back in October 7th through 11th. And you kind of have to dig down into the details, but now this is important to you is um, they took a sample, that one statistic was uh, based on a sample of 1,015 uh, adults aged 18 and, uh, and greater, and there's a ton of information here about the, how they sampled them, is it a random sample, um, all the things that we know that are important. But specifically for this unit, what we're looking at is, um, is that it was a 95% confidence level and that the margin of error was plus or minus 4%. So that's gonna be real important. If we flip back over here, we know that the uh, confidence interval, the 95% confidence interval for this would be 58% minus 4% or back to about, um, so minus 4%, 54%, and then 58% plus 4%, which that would be uh, 62%. So the 95% confidence interval for this would be between 54% and 62%. We're 95% confident that the true proportion of Americans favoring legal use of marijuana is between, uh, again, 54% and 62%. So then fast forward to 2019, and they're still asking that question. Um, and it was very interesting to, uh, to look this back up. And over that time series, it looks that since 2015, it kept going up and up and up until where now we're at uh, 66%. And I went and looked uh, up the, um, the same idea, if you can follow this PDF to go get the details, but it looks like their margin of error was now 3%. And of course, that would imply, uh, if we keep 95% confidence, that it was a bigger sample size. And this one was 1,526. Great, all things that make sense to us now that we know about the margin of error and how to make these confidence intervals for proportion. And I think almost most importantly is that when we see that big number, that big proportion, um, that's not the truth. That is the best estimate. And then there's a margin of error built around that. So let's look at some other examples. I talked about Pew Research. That's another company that conducts a lot of these political and business type uh, and social um, uh, polls. So uh, this one was um, kind of a, a contrasting idea of, or not contrasting it, but the same idea, US public opinion on legalizing marijuana to 2019. They did their own poll and found that 67% of their poll uh, now favored, and you can see over time that uh, somewhere back in 2010 uh, is when the lines crossed, when there were more people, at least according to the sample, that um, the evidence suggested that back in about 2010, 
uh, more people were uh, favoring than opposing the legalization of marijuana. But of course, it also has its uh, margin of error, and this one was 9,895 respondents, a much larger poll. Um, and it looked like at that point, we have a smaller margin of error, and it's about 1.5 percentage points. So there's a lot of evidence here um, that uh, there's a lot of empirical evidence, a lot of evidence from this poll that, um, that truly uh, the majority of Americans uh, are favoring legalized use of marijuana at the moment. So, okay, so um, let's look at the coronavirus. So Emerson College, also um, uh, Quinnipiac College, Emerson College, uh, Monmouth University, these are all universities that have over the years specialized in polling. And so they also conduct polls. So you can look at a lot of different polls and get um, and kind of get an idea of just how uncertain or certain somebody can be about a particular result. So um, the question here was with coronavirus, uh, how concerned are you about your personal health and finances? And um, this was a poll, uh, again, that had uh, more, than, uh, one, um, more than one option. They could be very concerned, somewhat concerned, not so concerned, or not concerned at all. So this is if you took, a, um, if you took another stats course, you could look at um, uh, confidence intervals and tests for when you have more than two options. So I wanted to throw that in there. But um, this one, this particular one here said March uh, national poll, 70% of Americans are worried about catching coronavirus. So this was one that had uh, just two options. And let's see here, it said um, a new Emerson College next year uh, polling finds 70% of respondents very worried or somewhat worried that they had immediate family member uh, that may catch uh, coronavirus. Only 22% reported to not be worried, and 7% are not worried at all. So again, this one had um, actually multiple options, uh, but you can also find a margin of error for that. It's just not, um, it's not as straightforward as when you have a dichotomous result. That is a result that only has two options. But I wanted to throw that one in there to show the kind of, um, kind of broad ideas. We can answer uh, more um, flexible questions like this uh, with statistics. So again, they're saying, hey, we sampled 1,100 people, and it's a 2.9% um, uh, margin of error for this one. So, uh, but moving on to the 2020 presidential uh, race. So um, at this point in time, Joe Biden has not uh, secured the uh, Democratic uh, nomination. However, if he had, uh, this question is polling, um, would you choose John, Joe Biden or Donald Trump if that was your choices? And so in this particular, again, this is a Monmouth University poll, and you'll see these polls a ton in election years like 2020. Um, so the total here, you can see it how it's broken down by different categories, conditional in different categories, but this one says, oh, well, it looks like in this particular sample, there were 48% in favor of Joe Biden and 45% uh, in favor of Donald Trump. And a lot of uh, people looking at this will just say, oh, looks like Joe Biden's in the lead. Looks like the, uh, ma that maybe not the majority, but there's more people favoring Joe Biden in the United States than Donald Trump. But notice that we know, we know the questions to ask. How many people are in this sample? Really, what sample did, you know, was this a random sample or did you only sample uh, Democrats or did you only sample Republicans? So all of that um, information, you have to dig a little bit deeper to get. Um, but I did that a little bit of digging. And so you can uh, see in here that, um, and you can go to this, uh, usually um, a reputable site will have a link, we'll either report it or we'll have a link to where you can find out the methodology of the, uh, uh, of the poll. So this is what I followed here. And it looks like we had 851 adults and uh, the results in this released are based on um, 754 registered voters and has a, uh, so it was based on these 754 registered voters and has a 3.6% uh, point sampling margin of error. So 3.6. So if you notice here, that three, looks like Joe Biden has a three point advantage in the sample proportion, but that is within the margin of error. So if you were to create a confidence interval for Joe Biden's uh, result, 45 would be in that confidence interval. 48 minus 3.6 uh, is about 44.4. So 45% um, would be in that confidence interval, and thus there's not enough evidence to suggest um, at the 95% uh, confidence rate uh, level, if that's what this is, and since it's not saying it, I'll assume that it's 
that this is within the margin of error. And that's what they mean by saying, well, the result is within the margin of error. There's not enough evidence to suggest that that's a, a statistically significant difference. So you might go look at another uh, sample. So here's a CNN poll sample um, around the same time period that suggests that Joe Biden has about a 10 point lead. So that's a pretty big difference. And, um, and so you'd say, well, who did you sample? So you could go through and, uh, and research. This study was conducted in CNN via telephone. So maybe not a random sample of everyone in the United States. Most everyone has a telephone these days, but where do they get those numbers from? There's a lot of questions to be asked. Um, they were conducted in this time period among 1,211 respondents. Um, so you might want to know landline were 443 and cell phone were 768, but the margin of error was 3.3%. Um, and there's other uh, more advanced statistics in here that again, I encourage you to take another stats course to learn about. But 3.3 um, uh, at 95% confidence level. So clearly that's outside of the margin of error. So if you put a lot of faith in this poll, you would think that, yeah, it looks like Joe Biden does have a significant, statistically significant advantage, and maybe a practically significant one at that. So um, here is um, an interesting idea that real, um, real clear politics, if you want to follow this link, real clear politics takes all of the, um, all of the polls that can get its hand on. So you can see Monmouth is running a poll, Emerson College is running an, a poll in this, uh, on this idea of Biden versus Trump. NBC, Economist, CNN, Quinnipiac, one I mentioned before, uh, Harvard Harris, IDB, uh, Fox News. Um, there's a lot of them in here that are conducting these polls. And, um, and so what Real Clear Politics has done has taken a weighted average of all of them because you can see the sample sizes. It's reporting it here, which is nice. And it's reporting the margin of error. Really cool site, this Real Clear Politics. But it weights these based on its sample size. It has more faith in the higher um, sample sizes than in other ones. And so it, uh, it pools those all together. It summarizes them into the Real Clear Politics average. And so the average of all of these polls right now is 50.9% for RCP and 43.9% for Trump. And you can see over here in the, col in the column, it tries to make it easy showing blue for Biden and red for Trump. And it looks like the evidence from these polls, from samples, would suggest that Biden has a significant lead right now. Now, you can click on any, I really encourage you to go to this site. Um, you can click on any of these and it uh, will take you to give you more information again about the uh, methodology, but it does give us the sample size and the margin of error here, but it doesn't tell us how it was sampled. Was it a, a poll? Was it a person on the street? How many, uh, well, it does tell us how many people, but where did that come from? Where did that information come from? Which could make a big result in what the actual result is. But again, this was taken 32720. Uh, um, so let me actually show that to you while we're sitting here. So I'm gonna go ahead and surf on over to this. If I click on over here, um, if we go to, let's just do it. So I'm gonna go on here to Real Clear Politics. And today is the 28th. And it looks like Fox News in the meantime has, uh, Fox News has registered a poll, right? Um, the, since the, um, since uh, the PowerPoint was made, that was the Monmouth was the top one. Now Fox News has one. And Fox News poll sampled 11, uh, 1,011, margin of error of three. Um, and it looks like 49 to 40 in favor of Biden. And so you click on Fox News. And in this one, it'll bring up the methodology of the Fox News poll. And very quickly in here, you can see interviews were con uh, conducted March 21 through 24, 2020, 1,111 registered voters and a sample size of three percentage points, which um, it doesn't tell us the confidence. So we'll assume that it's 95%, but flipping it back over here, we see that, yep, yeah, it was, um, uh, oh, not back over there, flipping back over here to the Real Clear Politics poll. Let's go back to the poll. Uh, that's exactly what it had, right? It said, oh, the margin of error was three and there's our 1,011. So that's just an example of how you, um, how you can really find out um, and kind of sift through the different biases that some different polling companies may have um, and, and kind of get an idea for yourself what the statistics are really saying. So let's jump back in. And all evidence here is that Biden has this clear lead. But if we go back to 2016, this is what and I taught this class in 2016. This is what um, this is what it looked like. This is what it looked like about three days before the election, 
right? You can check it out. The election was like on the 9th, I think, 11 9, November 9th. And um, three days before the election, it looked just like this, which is quite astounding. It's quite a, a really unique and amazing kind of statistical example to bring up here. But then you say, well, hmm, it's pretty close, actually. And some of these are within the margin of error. Uh, but um, USC decided, looks like USC here, uh, that was the one for Trump, LA Times USC tracking was uh, for Trump. It's the only one that favored Trump by three points. And that the margin of error here was 4.5 points, so it was in the margin of error, but still the only one that was siding with Trump. So I got to thinking, well, what is that? Because clearly, obviously Trump won uh, in 2016. And this was from Scientific American, a very reputable um, uh, uh, journal, um, hypothesized that um, behavioral scientists, at least one behavioral scientist, think emotion and fear of stigma led to respondents to mislead pollsters on purpose. And um, I actually, from a personal note, watched um, a news report once when they were, before the election, they were asking um, a voter and a pollster came to his house and he said, um, actually this was after the election, and he came to his house and said, who did you vote for? And he said, I voted for Donald Trump. And he said, well, did any pollsters come to your house? And he said, yes, a pollster came to my house. And who did, who did you say you were gonna vote for? He said, I was going to vote for Clinton. <laughs> and he said, why did you say that? And he said, I just, I lied. I, I thought that that's what they wanted to hear. So that's what I said when really that's what I want. You know, I voted for Trump. So there's a lot of people I've looked up in the um, recently. Um, I think some of them call them shy Trump voters. And some people think that's a real thing. And a lot of people think that's not a real thing. But that certainly is a plausible example because that is suggesting Clinton's going to win. Uh, the empirical evidence there is that Clinton would win, clearly Trump won, and what was up with USC? Um, so it was fascinating because I looked into that, and if you read through this down here, the part that um, I'm going to show you is uh, typically in the Bloomberg polls and the Monmouth polls and the Quinnipiac polls, they say Trump or Clinton, you choose Trump or you choose Clinton or whatever the other options are. The USC poll said that's not how people um, make decisions. They're not 100% Trump and 0% Clinton, or 100% Clinton and 0% Trump, or that there's different levels in there. So they said, well, let's record that also. So they allowed them, instead of saying, give me a Trump or Clinton vote, they said, every day uh, we invite one seventh of members, let's get here, you will vote. And the, so they said, um, where is it in here? So, Let's just read it from the top. USC, Don's Life, participating in Unstrained University of Southern uh, California in partnership. Every day we invite one-seventh of the members of the USA election panel to answer three predictive questions. What is the percent chance that? That's where I was looking for. Not do you vote for Trump or do you vote for Clinton, but what is the percent chance you will vote for Clinton? What is the percent chance you will vote for Trump? And that is what theirs was based on, and they nailed it even within the margin of error, so maybe they didn't nail it, but they were the only one who even had any hint of evidence that Trump was gonna win there. Um, so very fascinating, uh, very fascinating idea. So I encourage you to check that out. And that's, um, it's very interesting to see. Um, in fact, I encourage you to go look at the LA Times USC tracking poll now for, um, for uh, Trump versus Biden, because you notice that that wasn't in the most recent, um, at least the one that I put in up here, this one. The USC poll is not in this one. So I'll let you look that one up, but uh, really pretty fascinating ideas that are going on behind the scenes of these polls that we get in the newspaper and, and on TV. So um, the point here is make your voice heard. So one last public service announcement here is this is your world. Um, and you can kind of see back in 2004, 2008, 2012, 2016, hopefully this is astounding. It's always astounding to me that only of the voting age population only 50s, in the 50%, there's tons of people that are not turning out to vote. 55% um, in 2004, 58% back in 2008, 55% uh, back in 2016, the last election. So get out there and vote and make your voice heard. Um, another pretty fascinating one is that when you break it down by age group, um, these are traditionally, this is the one for 2008, but it's pretty representative of what they all are. Um, the red is female and the blue are males, so way to go females. Um, 
But also, look at the 18 to 24 year range. They are among the lowest um, that turn out to vote when really, arguably, they have the most to gain. They, uh, they're, they, most of these decisions and policies will, um, will affect this group over the years the most. And, uh, and yet, they, they don't have much to say about it in elections. Um, so that being said, get out, uh, get out and vote, get out and get really, um, get, into, get into it, get into who these people are that are making these political decisions that really affect your future. That being said, great job. That is how we can use confidence intervals uh, for a population proportion, as well as looking at margin of error and how the sample size uh, really affects that margin of error and what it can mean practically. So good work. See you next time.